today I'm speaking with Kathleen O'Brien. She's researched aging for over 12 years and she teaches classes on her aging philosophy through the University of Denver's Continuing Education Pro- Program. Uh, so she has some very interesting philosophies on aging that I can't wait to share with you. So enjoy. Make sure to grab the official Not Over Just Different Welcome Pack. It's filled with some of the best tools for inspiring your best life. All absolutely free. Just go to notoverjustdifferent.com forward slash welcome gift to download yours now. Hi, I'm Natalie Ledwell and welcome to Not Over Just Different, a podcast for women of a respectable age facing life's next new chapter. So grab a cup of tea and pour yourself a glass of wine and join me for some deep, real and candid conversations about everything from health, aging gracefully, relationships and how to make the next 50 years even better than the first. Well, hello everyone and welcome to this week's podcast. Uh, This week, we're going to be talking about something very interesting. Well, something that we all experience and that is aging. Um, but my guest, uh, Kathleen O'Brien, has a very interesting take, <laughs> to say the least, um, on the whole aging process, um, how we should be, our, what our attitude should be about it, how we should handle it, how we should, you know, be uh, not necessarily aging gracefully, um, but doing it in a much more empowered way. So, Kathleen, welcome to the podcast. How are you, darling? I'm fine, Natalie. How are you? I am fantastic. Um, so, I mean, I was going through your bio and, 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 you know, everything that you have. I know your website, uh, is, is growoldbehappy.com. Love, love the URL. <laughs> um, but you've had quite the colorful life. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey and how you got to this point? I have had uh, some wonderful careers, and I have been very, very fortunate, Natalie. Um, I have been able to do throughout my life pretty much uh, into careers pretty much that I wanted to be involved in. Uh, I started as an advertising copywriter. I was the first woman hired to write on a car account at a big agency in Detroit, and I got in on the end of that Mad Men era, you know, where um, secretaries were having affairs with their bosses, and bosses kept bottles of booze in their drawers, and they'd go out and have three martini lunches. And here I was in my 20s, and I'm thrown into this, and it was sort of a trial by fire, but um, I learned a lot about the business and I learned how to write. So I decided to take what I had learned there and I got into broadcasting. And this was in Detroit uh, at a time when Detroit was the fifth largest market there. So I was so fortunate to get in a market that large, really with no experience. And uh, every time I got a job, and maybe you've been like this too, when you get a challenging job, you think, uh, oh, I really want that job. And you talk your way into it. And then you go, oh, my gosh, I got the job. Um, now what am I going to do? I can't do this. So, um, but somehow I managed to do it. And I worked there and uh, worked briefly in Chicago and broadcasting and also out of Los Angeles for the Disney Network. Uh, And then I had my own business, video and film production. uh, And I ended up teaching media relations at two uh, graduate schools of business, University of Michigan and Indiana University. So um, that all of those things I enjoyed and I was privileged to be part of, of the g- group of people who, with whom I worked, and I learned so much from them. And then I decided to write this book after teaching some classes on my own philosophy on aging, which I, I kind of pulled together out of a, a lot of research. I kind of went at this kind of like a journalist would, having that background, and uh, and just I would just delve into all these texts about aging, and I look back at other civilizations, and I thought, 
you know, we're not doing this right. <laughs> uh, and, <laughs> and I think particularly as a woman, particularly as a woman, because when I was about to turn 60, which was over 10 years ago, I thought, how, how am I going to face this? Women become, and I hear this word, Natalie, all the time. They become, and they use this, invisible. Hmm. What happened to me? No one pays attention to me. No one answers my questions. They look right through me. Um, and I thought, I don't want that to happen to me. Mm. And is there another way to look at this process without feeling it's sort of a sad ride on the down slope, you know? And feeling like, I don't want to call myself old. I don't know, what am I, am I going to have to get Botox? Am I? So after I did all this research on ancient civilizations and also a leading edge of gerontology, I saw sort of a symbiosis between these two, which seemed like very disparate um, areas of study. And they were kind of coming together with this philosophy. And so I ended up teaching some classes on this uh, through the University of Denver's continuing education uh, program. And people kept saying, well, you should write a book. And I thought, well, heck, I've been a writer my whole life. Maybe I should write a book. Maybe this is a appropriate for me. So that's how I got here. Right. Well, and so I'm assuming that a the reason you chose aging is because of your own, you know, life experience. Um, and, you, you know, you're right. I, I think that uh, as women get older, we feel like, and, and, and my experience, because, you know, I'm a, I'm a little bit younger than you. I'm in my 50s. But, you know, now is the time where I feel like, you know what, I don't, there's no kids, there's no, you know, the, the, you know, and I'm, I'm actually in, in a new relationship. But, the, you know, there's a lot of the usual um, commitments and responsibilities that we don't really have anymore. But then we've got all this, we've got this time, we've got this experience, you know, we're kind of really in a, still in a very healthy part of our life. It's like, well, now what can I contribute? You know, so, um, so this is, looks like this is something that you really feel strongly about that you can contribute to really help women, you know, live this part of their life in a, in a way that they are being seen, you know, and that they are doing it in a way that they're not beating themselves up all the time. Yeah, that was really, uh, that was my motivation to do this. Um, and what I found is that a, a lot of people are pretty perceptive to this philosophy of mine. There are a lot of people, though, and I'm like this, too. We are so sucked into this culture that youth is everything, that our lives need to evolve around our youngest selves without really realizing that the later years in life are some of the most important years we will ever have. They are different than middle age. They are certainly different than youth. And uh, this constant envy of young people, of wanting to be younger, look younger, feel younger, is really, I think, standing in the way of our experiencing what aging is about. And you said it yourself. I have this time now. I'm more mature. So what should we be doing with these years? And it's interesting because if you look back at ancient civilizations or what I've sort of termed enduring civilizations, which are not unlike the ancient ones, Eastern, African, Native American, you will see that elders have a very important role in the culture. And it is not to be young, and it is not to compete with younger people. It is to be the wise person in the room right. to encourage younger people to see life from a more mature perspective. I mean, we've been on the planet 
longer than a 20 year old so why should 20 year olds be telling us you know you need to be more like i am look i think 20 year olds are fabulous and i think they should do what they're supposed to do which is go out and experience the world and sort of be scouts for people coming up behind them and make the most of their skills that's the time in life to do that but it's my time in life to maybe help them feel better about themselves maybe get them to slow down a little bit to see life from a a different kind of perspective and and we lose that we lose that wisdom of our elders when we force older people to continue to be middle-aged or as young as possible we're losing something and i think we do not only ourselves a disservice but i think we do the culture a disservice if we're not taking the mantle of elderhood and you know being old right and so what do you think are the contributing factors that have us trying to fight aging like you know we are like we are a, a, a civilization where you know we'll do the botox we'll do the fillers we'll you know do the lipo anything that we can to make ourselves look younger what do you think's the driving force behind that well actually i think the driving force or the result of it which also is right now the driving force is this huge marketing industry we have in our country uh, and in a Western civilization, certainly, to take advantage of all the things you just said. We want everybody to go out there and, uh, you know, get a personal trainer and get uh, their teeth whitened and get Botox uh, and buy a sports car and squeeze into tummy flattening underwear uh, because there's a lot of money to be made. Mm. off of doing all those things and that again perpetuates all of that 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 sort of youth envy that feeling that all of life really centers around people who are young and uh that our lives kind of stop when we grow older that no we need to circle back and be young no we need to go forward but what's interesting when i studied this one of the first things that was brought to me in in my research was that it sort of all began with graveyards believe it or not really all right do tell (laughs) well as it turns out people used to bury people in their backyards and we didn't separate the dead so much from the living it was all sort of this continual process and of course older people and in many enduring cultures they still do although they're getting away from it too older people will live with the family the whole family lives together so we see the importance of the various stages of life well when we started burying people in graveyards and separating them from us there began to be a feeling that well how close do I really want to be to older people? They're kind of on their way to the graveyard. And maybe I need to separate myself a little bit from them too. So that was sort of the beginning, at least uh, here and in Western society of saying, well, I think older people, you know, I either kind of don't want them around me so much, or I don't want to maybe incorporate them into my life as much because they remind me of death (laughs) and i certainly don't like death because i have removed people and put them way far away in a graveyard now some cultures today certainly have ancestors in graveyards all over the world one of the differences is though they visit their ancestors often they go and have a meal at the gravesite in some of these cultures that where they still honor the elder and um, they don't see they see life as a continuum which is really what it is it's not 
that it goes so far and then we need to circle back and be young again because that really goes against nature. That's not how any other living thing in the universe works. <laughs> you know, it moves on and that's what we're supposed to be doing too. Yeah. I know, well, I, uh, I'm i in a fairly new relationship, uh, newish relationship with a gentleman. He's uh, turning 60 this year. Mm -hmm. And he's having a bit of a challenge with it because he's like, that's a number, like, you know. (laughs) Um, But, and I said to him, I said, darling, but who you are and how you show up, your your health, all of that is a mindset, you know. I said, this is what 60 looks like now, you know. Don't, I said, what you're remembering is what 60 used to look like. But don't you think we've got to a stage where um, mindset, our mindset has changed a lot and we are thinking differently? We are like, you know, we're not getting to a certain point and then just, you know, going, okay, well, now I start to wear the granny outfits and now I start to act old because I'm supposed to be acting my age. Um, so don't you think there's a, like a mindset shift that's been happening? I, uh, yes, I think there is. But the thing that worries me about that is I would rather, and again, this is my philosophy, take bits and pieces of it as you will, Mm -hmm. but I would rather see someone enter their later years with curiosity and enthusiasm about what those years will bring rather than to say, you know, make old a pejorative. And we have made it that. It's so interesting when... um, I was reading so many books when I was putting my own book together. And one of them, several of them, were written by Ram Das. I imagine you may be familiar with him, a yes. philosopher. He died not all that long ago. But he tells an interesting story that he went back. Uh, he had been living in India for a while. And then he came back to the United States and was here. And then decided to go visit this small village where he had spent so much time And he couldn't wait to get back to see one of his closest friends whom he hadn't seen in a while. So he got off the train, got on the bus, took this long journey. And when he finally got there, he saw his friend and he ran up to him. And his friend said, oh, Ram Das, you're looking old. And of course, Ram Das had spent so much time here since his time in India, that he was taken aback. What do you mean I look old? I think I look pretty good. And, but that was a compliment. Mm. What it meant was, Ram Das, you have aged, you are mature, you have wisdom and experience, and you are a person of importance now. We will pay attention to you because you are an elder. And that's the difference between a culture like that and ours. Right. Exactly. You know, um, that uh, what I have found, like we were saying before, that we've got to, like, there's a mindset. And sometimes, you know, we'll have health issues, we'll have, you know, we'll look at ourselves aging, you know, we'll look at ourselves and have this whole self hate game going on. Um, and I know that it is attached to subliminal beliefs or subconscious beliefs. Um, and even if you're taking care of yourself, if you have like a subconscious belief that's being a saboteur for you, it's very di- difficult for you to get over that. You know, regardless of your body type, your eating habits, exercise rituals, if you don't identify what that is, it's very difficult for you to, to live a freeing life. So um, if you find that you're struggling with these kind of things, I encourage you to go to notoverjustdifferent.com forward slash health quiz. If you take the quiz there, it takes about 30 seconds uh, and we'll be able to give you some insights as to what that number one belief is that's holding you back from from what it is that you want to do. So um, Kathleen, I noticed in some of the notes that I received from you that um, you, uh, you want to see or you want people to see time and death as an ally. Okay, let's put that cat amongst the pigeons. <laughs> And I'm not that situation. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. That, that's sort of counterintuitive, isn't it? Yeah. Because we're trying to <laughs> we're trying to avoid death or put it off as long as we can. I think one of the problems we have uh, with aging in this country is that we are great deniers of death. 
we uh, like the whole graveyard scenario. We don't want to think about it. We don't want to deal with it. Um, older people, and, and rightly so, because older people need medical care. So we sometimes we do put them in nursing homes. And they do die in hospice, which is a wonderful way to, to take the journey onward. <laughs> because the hospice people uh, around the world do such a good job with this. But because we really separate ourselves from that and we don't see the continuum in life, um, we don't make room for the fact that death is a part of life. We haven't really accepted that, I don't think, in this culture. I mean, you'll have a memorial service, well, maybe not now because of the pandemic, but you'll have... Uh, some sort of a service and people feel bad, then they go and they have lunch and that's it. I mean, there are cultures where, you know, the grieving process goes on for a long time. The memorial goes on for a long time where people see that, uh, you know, death is an ally because it reminds us about the moment. It reminds us about life and how wonderful and precious it is, and not to waste any of it. And the older we get, if we begin to see death as an ally, it's something that's coming, and I talk about in my book ways that we can prepare for it. It's more the way the psyche prepares for it. Um, but uh, when we can do that and become a little more comfortable with it, I think that if death were more a part of our lives and not swept under the rug so much as it is in our culture, I think the feelings of getting older, I think that we would be more uh, accepting of, of the idea that life is a cycle. Yeah. It's, you know, childhood, adolescence, adulthood, middle age, and elderhood, and each stage is important. And also time, I had a whole chapter on time and how we can see time. And I do think that as we get older, and you talked about it because we have more, if you will, time, <laughs> that we have time to slow down, to be in the moment, to reflect, which is such an important part of being an older person, looking inside, who, who am I really? Uh, what do I want my life to be going forward? What is my, if you will, if you want to get spiritual, and I think older people certainly do, where is my place in the cosmos? Mm. I mean, all of those are big questions. You can't really answer those questions completely when you're young. You can only do it when you're older. And that's why taking that time and being in the moment is so important. Yeah, absolutely. And because uh, the other thing that, and I think having a spiritual practice is very important um, because one of the things that my spiritual practice does for me is it doesn't make me fear death. Actually, it doesn't make me fear many things because, you know, I have this, I surrender into knowing that everything's happening in divine timing exactly when it's supposed to. So it makes my whole life a whole lot easier but, uh, you know, I, I imagine that there's, uh, there's a lot of fear that comes up for people, you know, as they're getting older as well. And I, I don't know whether it's the, the fear of getting sick, the fear of not being able to look after themselves. You know, what have you found is, is some of the common fears that come up for people? I think you're talking about them. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, it's important to face our losses and the things that are perhaps going to happen to us. Look, I'm not saying old age is just, you know, it's like being a kid and running around and feeling fabulous all the time. It's different in that we have the maturity to experience things younger people can't experience. That's the important importance of it. But yes, the fear of death is certainly something that hangs over all of us. And as we get closer, I know, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a little secret, Natalie. When I turned 70, I didn't want to celebrate it. 
And here I had, you know, I was still in the throes of writing this book, and I thought, what is wrong with me? I'm supposed to be an advocate for all of this. And, and you know, but we're all human, and it's okay to to be a little bit afraid. I, it's interesting because one of the references I used in my book is a professor of philosophy, and his name is Shelley Kagan, and he's at Yale, and he's an atheist, and he talks about fear of death from an atheist point of view, which isn't mine. I, my spiritual feelings are more like yours, Natalie. Yeah. And, you know, I, I find great comfort in, in my feelings about the divine and my own spiritual experiences. But, you know, basically what he's saying is that it's, it is a human we are the only beings who know we're going to die. So, I mean, it is a very human experience. And I think knowing that, that's like, okay, I, I'm i human. I want to experience what it is to be human. It isn't all fun. Sometimes it is thinking about things that are a little scary. But uh, in the way he gets around it, he says, I think living forever would be horrible. He said, being alive alive is hard enough if i had to go on forever that would really scare him so i mean you've got to find your own spiritual path and find something that makes you feel good and i think what you're talking about is is so true about how you feel spiritually because that's such a comfort when you finally figure it out and say yeah i really feel this way it it is there's a, a tranquility that kind of comes over you. Yeah. And and again, I think that's the sort of thing you get in old age, and it's kind of hard to sometimes get it when you're younger. Yeah, absolutely. Because when you're younger, you're hustling. You're forcing it yes. to happen. You make it kind of make it. But now it's just like, oh, no, I, I learned that lesson. I don't have to do that. <laughs> I get to go well, with it, flow. <laughs> it's appropriate to hustle when you're yeah, young. Absolutely. That's what young people do, and it's cool, and it's wonderful. And I say more power to them. I feel like you do. I no longer want to do that. I want to do the things that make me happy. And frankly, after having lived 72 years, I should be able to. Yes. That's how I feel. Yeah. So uh, growoldbehappy.com is your website. Is that also the name of the book? No. That Well, you know what? That was my working title. But I ended up giving a lecture at the University of Denver uh, that was under the auspices of their science department. So I changed it a little to make it sound a little more scientific. And then I ended up using it as the title of my book, which is Reclaim Your Right to Grow Old, How to Immerse Yourself in, Be Curious About, and Celebrate Life's Most Important Stage. Right. You know what? Absolutely. So before we go, I just want to ask you, what is it that you love most about being this age? Hmm. Ah, wow. There are so many things. I think what I like most is that I really feel I am finally totally myself. Right. I don't have to pretend to be something I'm not in order to get a promotion. Or <laughs> I am just me, and I think it's great, and I love it when other people are who they are too because that's, that's really how human beings um, communicate with one another and feel close to one another when they are authentic. Yeah. And, and I feel pretty authentic at this point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree. I would, I would have definitely received you as authentic. <laughs> well, yeah, darling, likewise. Yeah. <laughs> well, darling, thank you so much for your time today. It's been such a pleasure chatting with you. So, guys, don't forget to go to growoldbehappy.com uh, and you'll be able to get access and, and find out all about the book on the website. Thanks for joining us today. Now, if you enjoyed this episode and haven't yet subscribed to our podcast, please go ahead and do so on iTunes or Spotify or go to mindmovies.com forward slash podcast so you don't miss an episode. And remember, new episodes are released every Monday morning. And this podcast is also brand new and we'd love to spread the word. So after you've subscribed, be a great girlfriend and pass it on to a friend who will enjoy this too. 
And don't forget to grab your official Not Over Just Different Welcome Pack. It includes some of the best tools for inspiring your best life, all completely free. Head over to notoverjustdifferent.com forward slash welcome gift to grab yours today. Until next time, remember it's not over, just different. Just different.